Good morning. It's Wednesday midday again, and I'm so glad to be with you. We have been looking through the Gospel of Mark, and it is a fascinating for year B of the Revised Common Lectionary to be looking at the Gospel of Mark, because Mark is the earliest, as we know, of the Gospels. It is written perhaps 25 to 30 years after the death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ, and it was written because people were beginning to die who knew the story. The early church could get together and say, you know, hey, Samuel, Ruth, somebody, you can remember what happened. Tell us the story of Jesus. Well, Mark has got a chance to write it down, and we know he's the earliest writer because Matthew and Luke never disagree against Mark's uh, book. So today we're going to talk about the uh, healing of Legion and what it really means and how it follows into this incredible unfolding of what Mark sees in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Prayers at midday begin, and they begin if you have a BAS or if you'd like to just follow along. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, O God, make speed to save us, O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows his handiwork. One day will tell its tale to another, and one night will impart its knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all the lands, and their message to the very ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens, and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing can be hidden from its burning heat. The Psalm Prayer. O God, the source of life, you fill the earth with beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. For the sake of him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the second book of Corinthians, the second story, second epistle, written to the people of Corinth from Paul. For anyone who's in Christ, there's a new creation. For the old creation has gone, and now the new one is here. It is all God's work. It was God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the work of handing on this reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any more, even with a chain for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, "'What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God?' I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a hill on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it to the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus 
and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the, had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As we talk about Mark today, I want to uh, begin by talking about some award that you may not be aware of. The Edgar is a coveted prize. Uh, it's given out every year or so by a group of mystery writers. They come together and decide who should receive the Edgar for that year. It's kind of like the Academy Award, the Emmy Award, but it's done for perhaps the most innovative and interesting mystery writer of the year. The Edgar Award is named after uh, Edgar Allan Poe, because Edgar Allan Poe is credited with writing the first mystery story. In 1841, he wrote a short story called Murders in the Rue Morgue. It has been read by many people as a short story, but it's also been produced as a movie several times. Murders in the Rue Morgue was considered one of the first mysteries of having to solve why are these murders happening and how do you find out where they come from. So the Gospel of Mark, I think, is probably an older mystery than that. Gospel of Mark was written properly 25 to 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Christ of God. And it was written nearly 2,000 years before Murders in the Rue Morgue. And it's written very much like a mystery. Who is this man, Jesus? And as you read Mark, you realize how he's going about telling you. He's telling you through miracles and other things, but people often stop and say, who was that? Or who, who does that? Or what power does he have? How amazing is that? And so it's the mystery that unfolds in front of you. Each of the Gospels is trying to tell you something about Jesus. Matthew is a Jew who's writing about Jesus is almost the new Moses, the new head, if you will, of Judaism. Uh, Luke is a Greek, and he's writing his on the idea of Greek gods, that here is God with us. Here is God who has come down to be with us. Mark is kind of saying, this is, this is the mystery. Who is he? How do you feel he is? What do you feel he is? Because he can do these amazing things. Last week we talked about the miracle in Capernaum, where he heals someone. Now he has gone across the lake and he's come to a village where there's a man who is possessed by many demons. And he's called Legion because he has so many demons. Demons used to be a sort of a you know, satanic kind of word, but I think today we know that demons are also those phobias, those fears, those psychoses that people struggle with. And many people struggle with them so badly that they become psychotic, they can become schizophrenic. They can be dealing with so many of the demons that cover human life, and they're very real. They're very real to people. We have different names for them today, but nevertheless, they are the demons that bother us, that infect us, that trouble us. One of the greatest innovations in the last, oh, probably decade or two, two decades maybe, has been DNA testing. DNA testing has told us a great deal about ourselves and about people particularly in areas where crime may be committed. We've learned from our own DNA what genes we carry that might affect our health in the long run. For instance, my family has a gene that affects uh, colon rectal cancer. My father and my grandfather both died of it and I had it uh, dealt with it when I was uh, just basically 29 years of age. There are also the DNA in the criminal uh, activity detection has told us that perhaps people who are convicted years before of terrible crimes may now because of DNA been proven innocent. So it's been proven a worthwhile and a very important part of detection 
it's become very, very important that we know and understand what's been going on. 25 or 30 years after the death of Jesus, the technologies, the world was changing. Uh, people had remembered when Christians gathered together the stories of Jesus and they were told and retold because oral history was important to the Jewish people in the Middle East and their oral history was kept very securely. But now we know that years have passed and just like DNA has come and gone, times have changed in Israel. So that when Mark is sitting down to write, new memories have come forward, new thoughts have come forward, new people have come forward, and yet they are people who cannot change the real story. In other words, the story is still real, but it's also one that can't be edited away. And I mean by that, it's simply that when you and I hear fairy tales, we know that somehow they're always going to be a happy ending and things will always work out. But when Mark is sitting down to write his gospel, he can't walk away from the fact that things happened that may not be what he likes to talk about, but he has to talk about. The healing of Legion, he couldn't avoid telling what was really happening there. What really happened is not just the healing, but the aftermath of what happened in that healing sequence. In other words, if you'd like to tell a story about healing, you say, well, Legion walked away and it was all fine and Jesus got in the boat and went away. But that's not the ending. The ending he could not avoid. The ending he couldn't just edit out was the fact that the people of that village lost thousands of pigs and they said to Jesus, please, please go away. Charlie was uh, one of my roommates when I was in university. Uh, we lived at a student residence. Charlie's family lived near Winnipeg, and uh, uh, one of our roommates actually was a student pilot, so uh, he flew Charlie and uh, four, there were four of us. We flew into one of those Cessna four-seaters up to his family farm. It was nearly 500 acres of uh, silage and things that they grow, mostly corn, and they raised every year we were given 400 fairly small pigs and feeding them and looking after them, they raised those pigs to adulthood and then those pigs were sent off to market. Um, we had a wonderful time visiting with the uh, family of Charlie. Uh, they put on a big meal for us and being a farm family, there was never lack of food. But it was obvious that the smell of the pigs was pretty tough to take. Uh, 400 or 500 pigs leave quite a stench, especially if you keep them penned into a small area. Now, in biblical times, they probably would let them more free range. And it seems that that's the story Mark's telling. The pigs had uh, uh, given free range to wander. Uh, but in many farms today, that is not true. So, Charlie's family really depended on those pigs for their living. That was how they made their life as farmers. Yes, they brought in the, the silage, the corn, uh, the wheat, whatever it might be. And yes, they did feed the pigs, but it was really important to them that as many pigs survived as possible because they're going to send them off to market and they have to make a profit in order to make the farm go. So the death of 2,000 pigs in this story is a brutal ending to what happens to Legion because those 2,000 pigs are suddenly infected with all of his phobias, his fears, his psychoses, and they are terrified by all of this. Suddenly, all of that, those demons of life have been thrown into this great herd of pigs, and they're killed. They run off a cliff and they die. And suddenly, the people of the village are realizing their living has disappeared almost. I mean, if you depend on those pigs for your living, then it's gonna be tough. Now, we know Jewish people weren't big on pigs. I mean, they're, they're not kosher. But maybe Jewish people were raising pigs for others. Or maybe even this community was not particularly Jewish. We know that Jesus spoke to Samaritans and others. It may be that in healing uh, Legion, he was healing people who were not necessarily Jewish. But we do know that the loss of those pigs would have been devastating to that entire community. The loss of so many would be devastatingly hard. So at the end when they say, you know, please leave us, they're not saying that because they're afraid that he's some kind of great sorcerer or great miracle worker. 
they've lost a lot and they're hurting. And this is not part of a story we want to really hear because the truth of the matter is the miracle comes at a price. And perhaps all miracles come at a bit of a price. Perhaps it's like the old saying, you know, be careful what you look for. Be careful what you ask for. Because somehow, like in physics, to every action, there's an opposite reaction. And sometimes what we ask for cannot be what we really need or want. I was reading about Greta Thunberg, and you may know who she is. She's the 18-year-old who's been now nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. And she is an ecologist. She's somebody who looks at the ecology of the earth and says, you've got to change things or it's going to be too late. You've got to make a difference. You've got to do something to make this world change. And just one young woman, that one young Swedish girl, has made a huge impact on our world. She has been center fold for all of these different organizations and groups and ecological groups. She has had a profound effect on young people particularly. And wherever she goes, crowds come to hear her and to listen to her. She has done an amazing job for one human being. And she's shown to all of us that one person can make a huge difference. And that's how we probably should see this story about Legion. One person can make a huge difference. And it may cost something. Greta Thornburg recognizes that in doing what she's doing, she will put many people out of work and she will cause much disruption of what our current international affairs go. I mean, coal industry, oil industry, all of these things are going to take a hit if we begin to think ecologically about the future of this planet and your future and my future. I was reading an article today about how the advancement of solar energy has become so profound that South Africa has entered a whole new era of solar energy that is going to provide more power than they've ever known. But in doing these changes, it's going to affect everyone. The change that Jesus brings about with Legion is affecting many, many people. Because that one person that he is taking time for makes a huge difference in the lives of all. One person matters. And what Jesus is trying perhaps to say and what Mark is trying to find way out of this story is to say this one person, this one person named Legion for all of those demons he has to deal with in life, that one person has been making a difference and now can make a huge difference in the lives of other people and in fact does goes off to other towns, goes off to the Decapolis, the ten cities, goes off and spreads the word about Jesus. Yes, there's pain. In the midst of change, there is always going to be pain. You and I know that in the midst of this coronavirus, we want to get back to normalcy. It has been painful to change every day. It's been painful to isolate ourselves. It's been painful to wear a mask everywhere and worry about where the next germ may come from. It's been terrible here in Barrie to look at a place like Roberta Place where so many of the caregivers and so many of those who are given care have now succumbed to the coronavirus. We want to see normalcy and change is brutal. But in this case, just like Greta Thornburg talking to people and saying, you've got to change to save the planet. We also have to change to see the welfare of others. We have to change to see that one human being can make a difference. We have to change because we are followers of Jesus. And as painful as it may be for all those pigs to be lost to that community, one person, one person, this one human being, will go out and spread the word, the good news of Jesus Christ. Mark has already spread it, but he also can't avoid the truth. He can't avoid telling you the story as he knows it, that there will be pain in miracles, in changes, in all those things. The good news of Jesus Christ will not always be good news to everyone everywhere, but it will be the beginning, the beginning of change, to see that God so loved the world he's given you his son. For you and I to recognize that in the midst of a pandemic, we have to find good news. We have to know that we all share in this struggle, that we're all part of this together. And for those people who sneak off to the sunshine and do all kinds of things, all they're doing is avoiding the reality that you and I have to share and care together. That we're all part of one picture. 
We're all part of one humanity. And one person needs to remind us time and again that one human being, one life, as in the life of Jesus Christ, can make a huge change to everyone in this world of ours. May God bless you and yours through the midst of this pandemic. And may God teach us through this time that we are not alone, that every one of us, like Legion, can make a huge difference. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, let us pray, saying, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Comfort us in all our afflictions throughout this pandemic time. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that all the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Fill the world with the radiance of your glory that all nations may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and every day. Amen.